This is the Berman Method podcast featuring Dr. Jake Berman and physician assistant Jenny Berman. We are here to treat problems and not symptoms. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to treat anyone or to give medical advice. If you are interested in any information that we are giving and would like to use this for yourself, we recommend that you contact your primary care physician or reach out to us and ask us questions about yourself specifically. Enjoy. And we're rolling, baby. We are back for the second week of January. New Year, New You, the Berman Method podcast where we're focused on treating problems and not symptoms. We are sticking it to Goliath right now. We're saying F you, corporate medical system, Western medicine, you ain't right. You don't have our best interests in heart. And Jenny's eyes are rolling right now because she's going, holy cow, let's take it down a notch. That was a tangent for early January. <laughs> Dr. Jake Berman here, making sure that you're awake with my lovely co-host. Jenny Berman, physician assistant. JBB, Jenny Bear Berman, for those of you who really know Jenny on a, a friend level, friendship level. Personal basis. Personal basis, yeah. JBB. How's your January going? It's going great now that I have to be cookie free for the next 30 days. No cookies. Yeah, I said last on the last podcast, if we had 10 people calling you to do your your kickstart program by noon, that I would go cookie free for the next 30 days. And I would be, I'll be darned if 17 people didn't call before noon. That's right. So now you're cookie free. They just wanted to... Not only help themselves, but help to save your brain. <laughs> Did you know that sugar is one of the most high, the most high risk? I don't know if that's like proper grammar, but we're not English majors here. But sugar is one of the things that increases the risk the most of developing dementia. If you could just say that to me on a regular daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, at some point, I'll start to hear. Sugar's going to make you lose your brain. Just keep saying it. <laughs> Sugar's going to make you crazy. <laughs> no, it's going to make you crazy because That's I'm going to be in la-la land. Yeah, you won't even know what's happening. <laughs> but seriously, on a on a serious note, sugar is going to kill you. It's not the fat from animal protein. It's not the animal protein. It's not anything but sugar. It's not the sodium. That's another one. People are always like, I can't have that. It has too much sodium in it. The sodium is actually helping you. It's not sodium that's going to kill you. It's sugar. Sugar is the devil. Okay. <laughs> Happy January. <laughs> Oh, man, I love it. 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 And it's funny, we can go off on this tangent a little bit longer. What are the biggest revenue generators in America? The sugar companies and the pharmaceutical companies. That's right. So keep that in mind when you're watching your commercials, when you're hearing commercials, when you're seeing billboards as you drive down the road there's hidden agendas in all of these things. And sugar's not just the candy, the ice cream, the chocolate. It's the bread, the pasta, the potatoes, the hamburger with the bun, with the french fries, and the mm. soda. Mm. Soda is all sugar. Man, I can't remember the last time I had soda. No, me neither. I used Truly. to drink soda at least once a day. Diet Coke. I had a diet... Coke or Diet Dr. Pepper in my lunch every single day growing up in middle school. My mom would pack it. She'd wrap a piece of napkin and foil around it so it would stay cold and wouldn't sweat in my paper lunch bag. And yep. I had a diet soda, a sandwich, two cookies, and chips every single day of my lunch. Yep. And this isn't a knock on your mom. It was just that's the way it was back then. Right. We didn't know any better. Yeah, you didn't know any better. So now we do know. That's right. And that's not good. So here's to say that your diet can be reversed. 
the damage you are doing can be reversed. You just have to be disciplined to reverse it. And you have to know the right things to do. And know how, yeah. Yeah, you got to have a coach. You got to use us. So I want to get on a rant today because Albert, one of my PTs, sent me a text message of this post from WebMD where so many people go to search for answers for their ailments, their symptoms, looking for diagnoses. So many people go to WebMD to figure out, is this cancer that I have or what is it? WebMD is known as Dr. Google. Yep, Dr. Google, WebMD. And when Albert sent me this message, at first I was infuriated. I was, we were sitting on the couch, remember? And I was going, what the F, are you effing kidding me? And then 15 seconds later, I just started laughing, Mm -hmm. laughing hysterically. And this is at eight o'clock at night. And Jenny looks over at me and she goes, what the hell are you doing right now? (laughs) And I read her, let me get it real quick. I read her this thing from Albert that is straight from WebMD. And it says, walking barefoot or in flimsy shoes without sufficient arch support can overstretch, tear, or inflame your plantar fascia. So saying that being barefoot is bad for your feet. (laughs) Yes. So here's the catch. And here's the part that people will not dive into. Technically, this is true. Technically, this couldn't be farther from the truth because you got to have the context behind it. So the context meaning or being, the context being, if you live in shoes and you've been in shoes for 20, 30, 40 years of your life, whether it's high heels for 10, 12 hours a day at work, or if you're in tightly laced tennis shoes for 8 to 15 hours a day, and you all of a sudden start walking barefoot or in flimsy shoes without sufficient arch support, yes, that can aggravate you. And that can flare you up and that can cause plantar fasciitis. There's a reason though. Yes. Okay. There is a reason. You're going to get to that. Yes. The reason is because all of the muscles in your feet, there's 16 muscles in the arch of your foot alone, four layers of four muscles, and those 16 muscles are supposed to be your arch support. But when you're wearing shoes for 8 to 15 hours a day, those muscles don't have to work. They're essentially in a cast. Your foot is essentially in a cast. And what happens when you don't use muscles? Don't use it, you lose it. They atrophy and they get smaller and they get weaker. So then when you do decide to go walking barefoot or wearing some nice flip flippy floppies and walk down the beach, you get pain. And you're like, oh, it's because I don't have my comfortable arch support shoes. Oh, this is driving me nuts. So before we get too far into it, this is a a thing that I want to say is, I'm going to read it again. This is straight from WebMD. Walking barefoot or in flimsy shoes without sufficient arch support can overstretch or tear the plantar fascia. Now, for most of you out there, you are you haven't been in anatomy classes and you you haven't ever done cadaver lab, so you never had to dissect a human cadaver. I have, Jenny. I don't know if you did the plantar fascia. In your mm-hmm. cadaver lab. I don't think you did. No. But I'll tell you this. Out of the entire body in, in PT school, we dissected the entire body. And I do mean the entire body. From head to toe, we dis- dissected the entire thing. What I can tell you that I had the most difficult time dissecting was the plantar fascia. So the bottom of the foot, the plantar fascia. And the palmar fascia. Mm. So you essentially have a plantar fascia in your palm, and it's called your palmar fascia. Now, don't forget that I grew up 
my entire life cleaning deer. So I'm a hunter, avid hunter, have been a hunter my whole entire life. And I process the meat myself, or at least I quarter it myself, put it in, in coolers and then take it to the processor. So I always field dress my deer or clean my deer, hang them up. And I, I'm very good at cleaning an animal. So my lab partner, Sarah, she'll laugh at, at this because she was not good at this. And I get a scalp on my hand. I just start going to town because it's essentially the same thing. It's the same anatomy, humans, deer, dogs. It doesn't really matter. It's so similar that it's, it's scary sometimes how similar it is. But what I can tell you is when I got to dissecting the plantar fascia, I cannot tell you how many blades I went through because it's so thick and so tough. Now this freaking thing on WebMD is trying to tell you that just by you walking on your own accord, you're walking, that you're going to overstretch or tear this massively strong ligament. It's a ligament because it attaches bone to bone. It's not a tendon. Mm -hmm. Tendon attaches bone to muscle. So it's a ligament. Ligaments are so strong because mm -hmm. they have to be. They're attaching bone to bone. And WebMD is sitting here saying that you're going to overstretch it or tear your plantar fascia just by walking. Mm -mm. <laughs> Jenny's shaking her head right now and I'm going, I'm just losing my mind. Mm -mm -mm. Absolutely losing my mind because like, here's what what's going to happen. It's going to get inflamed first and it's going to create a pain response. And that pain response is going to get so severe that you're not going to walk barefoot anymore. So you'll never get to the point where you actually can tear. tear it. Your plantar fascia will never be vulnerable enough so that it can tear because there's going to be a significant amount of pain that will occur before that occurs and you won't push yourself through it with simple walking barefoot. Now, a traumatic injury is different. You fell or something happened to where there was a very quick force to the plantar fascia. That's a different story. Right, right. That's a completely different story. But what I want everybody to get away from this or take away from this is I'm not just ranting again on the plantar fascia, even though I'm sure out of these 70 plus podcasts that we've had, 60 of them are <laughs> I've talked about the foot and being barefoot and plantar fasciitis. Yes. The thing I want you to get away from this is you can overly misread or misinterpret what this thing is saying. So you have a, a problem with your foot. You go to WebMD to search what's the causes of foot pain. And this thing is saying that walking barefoot can tear your plantar fascia. You must remember that there is context with it, meaning that if you never go barefoot, you probably shouldn't go cold turkey and quit shoes and start walking barefoot again. However, the reason why you're having foot pain is because you haven't been going barefoot, because you haven't been wearing the flimsy flip-flops. Because when you do go barefoot and you do wear flimsy flip-flops and walk appropriately in those flimsy flips, flimsy flips, flops <laughs> without, <laughs> without curling your toes as you're walking because most people curl their toes when they're walking in flip-flops so that they don't actually slide off your feet when you walk appropriately barefoot and in flimsy shoes you're actually using muscles in your feet when you use those muscles you're actually supporting your plantar fascia so that it can't quote unquote overstretch or tear so that's the part that you've got to know is the context of what's happening. Now, the same thing is true for so many other diagnoses when you go to Dr. Google, go on WebMD and search for these things. You've got to know the context that's behind them or you will completely misread this. Right. I uh, agree 100% in all, all fields, not just the physical field. So... so one thing that I want everybody to remember is there's hidden agendas everywhere. And I'm going to go and spread a rumor right now with the next thing I'm going to say because I've not fact-checked this at all. However, I would not be the least bit surprised if Dr. Scholes doesn't have stock in WebMD. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying that lightheartedly and I'm kind of being sarcastic and, and joking right now. However, you've got to remember that these big companies, these revenue generators 
of America. We've got the sugar companies we were talking about earlier. We've got the pharmaceutical companies. We've got Dr. Scholl's. Where have you seen advertisements for Dr. Scholl's? On television. Everywhere oh. is the answer. Google. Yeah, it's true. Yep. Google, Walgreens. television, yeah. Walgreens, billboards, mm -hmm. radio shows. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Now you have to understand how much money does it cost to be everywhere? That's true. We're talking millions of dollars. It's very true. Millions so of dollars. So what are they making to be able to advertise like that? Correct. So if you can afford to budget millions of dollars a year to marketing, then your revenue has to be at least 10x that. Right. Because you're, you're generally going to allocate around 10% to marketing, 10% of your revenue to marketing max. Most people are doing 1% or 2%. However, the big businesses that are very successful, they're going to allocate somewhere between 5 and 10% of their annual revenue to marketing. So if Dr. Scholz can afford to allocate, let's say, $10 million, I'm just making numbers up right now, then that means that they're generating at least $100 million, right? which is still peas compared to sugar companies and pharmaceutical companies. So again, these numbers are all just made up. I just want everybody to understand that there's hidden agendas everywhere. You just got to do your homework and you got to understand it. And I said this multiple times, you've got to question everything. Question us. You should be questioning us. And if you don't get an answer that makes sense, then go somewhere else. Right. Right. You have to question all providers to make sure that the research is being done and that it's the right treatment for you because there's no one treatment fits all. Uh, so you have to make sure that you're questioning what is right for your individual body and getting the basis behind it. Right. I agree with that. So I don't know that we need to go much farther into this thing. I think this podcast can be short and sweet with a, an overall take home message of question really question it where are you getting your information and what's the reason behind that information now i'm going to go out on a limb here and this might make some more enemies not that i i could always use more enemies because i'm i'm just saying what i want to say if you look at primary care physicians for example i'm not trying to say they're being malicious or doing something intentional however you got to understand that the pharmaceutical reps are at the primary care physician's office every day. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be saying, okay, this new drug is the new drug. And they're going to highly recommend that that primary care physician prescribes that drug. And what do you think the incentive is? It's true. That's part of it. But it also, which we've talked about multiple times with uh, Western medicine, mm -hmm. is the fact that Doctors have to get patients in and out and have them say, okay, here's your problem. Here's what we're going to do to treat your problem because it's a pill. It's something we can do. We know you're going to get effects from it rather than having the time or the insurance reimbursement to actually say, here's the problem. Let's treat, treat the problem and not just the symptoms. So to kind of go off of what you're saying is the pharmaceuticals are playing a big role into it, but it's also something we've talked about many, many times is the insurance companies dictating how providers can treat their patients based off of reimbursement levels, time allotments, and just the ability that doctors want ultimately want to make sure their patients are not dying and are feeling better. So whatever the quick answer is to say, okay, you're not going to die and you're going to feel better. So we'll see you again in three months. Have I a good day. It. I love it. And that's not, that's not the answer for majority of us. It's not a long-term solution. It's not the fix. It's not figuring out what the problem is. Nope. So to kind of go back with your with your feet is, you know, you push and you even have a chapter in your book a lot that we need to be going barefoot, but it's not that you want people injuring their feet to come in and see you that you want them to go barefoot. You want them to go barefoot because they're actually going to utilize the muscles in the bottom of their feet and prevent long-term atrophy 
breakdown, muscle breakdown and problems. It's about, again, fixing the problem, not treating the symptoms. Yep. So real quick, tell your story. You're pregnant right now. And what happened to you six weeks ago or so? Yeah, I was just pushing, I think, like 26 weeks pregnant. And I woke up one morning and I went to the gym and I came home and I told Jake, I said, I got the plantar fasciitis. <laughs> <laughs> and he started laughing at me and he was like, what? And I was like, really? I just woke up this morning and it got on the elliptical and I was like, man, my plantar fascia hurts. And it was bothering me. And it did for a couple of days. But when when I said that to him, I said, I need you to work on my feet. And he goes, no, it's your body. Your feet aren't strong enough for the weight that your body is gaining from being pregnant. And he didn't say it in you know a malicious way, but that's naturally what happens to women when they get pregnant. But he is correct that I had been wearing more of my fluffy, soft, clouded, padded shoes in the office more. Uh, I had been not wearing as much of my flats or my what we call zero shoes by Noble that I have. So I was wearing shoes that had more support to them. And he was like, you're wearing shoes with support. So you're not activating the muscles and your body is changing. Muscles are getting more lax. You're gaining more weight. And my feet just weren't strong enough for that. So to his recommendation, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm not going to wear my fluffy shoes for two weeks, I'm just going to wear either my zero shoes or go flats or in the office. I've even been taking my shoes off and going barefoot a little bit just in my socks. And my plantar fasciitis went away. Magic. And you I didn't did, tear it. I didn't tear it. I didn't need a cast. I didn't need insoles. No and injections. I, no injections. I didn't even need you to do any manual work on it. Yeah. But to kind of go into that real quick, because I know this is kind of getting off topic, but just a week before that, I had been out with our dogs running around and I rolled my ankle real bad running around with the dogs. And again, it was just the fact that I wasn't paying as close of attention as I should have been, but my muscles just weren't. Coincidence, right? No, yeah, No, it wasn't a coincidence. My muscles weren't being activated appropriately from yeah. my feet atrophying. Yep. So. It happens to me almost every single year, plantar fasciitis, and it always happens at the same time of year, which is around December, beginning of December, my right plantar fascia starts to aggravate and flare up on me. And it's because for October and November, I'm hunting a lot. And when I'm hunting, I'm usually wearing hunting boots, which is the exact opposite of what I wear the other 10 months out of the year, which is nothing. I'm barefoot 99% of the time. So when I'm wearing these hunting boots for two months, my muscles are not working. So then in December, when I'm back in the office wearing bare, walking barefoot again, my plantar fascia flares up. So I just had to have Rafa free up my plantar fascia, get my muscles pumping again, and I had to do my homework, and it's fixed again. So shoes are not the answer directly. Right. You have to be very strategic with it. Right. So Good. don't go to Dr. Google question your providers, make sure you're treating problems, not symptoms. Yep. I hope everybody's doing well on their New Year's goals. Yep, your jump start. Stay disciplined. Yep, all of your clients that sign up for jump start. That's that right. was fun. That's, right. That's fun. It's still going. It is fun. Yes, it's a great time. And yep. just remember, this is my message to you for the week. It's not about the motivation. It's about the discipline. Yep. Everybody You're not going to be motivated all 100% of the time, but you can stay disciplined 90% and still move forward. I'm never motivated to go to the gym. Never. But I'm very disciplined at going. Right. There is a lot of mornings when I pull up to the gym and I'm like, man, I would love to just sit here, the heater on, <laughs> and just take a nap for 30 minutes. But it's the discipline to get out and go do it. It's not mm -hmm. motivation. It's right. discipline. It's habit. So keep it up. All right. Thanks, guys. Keep on keeping on, baby. Stick it, Dr. Scholes. Ciao for now.
Thank you for subscribing on your social media and podcast platforms to The Berman Method. Dr. Jake Berman with Berman Physical Therapy and Jenny Berman, Physician Assistant with Berman Health and Wellness. You can find more information on our website, www.bermanpt.com for physical therapy, bermanpt.com forward slash wellness for the health and wellness. You can also find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and on your podcast platform. So be sure to follow us, like us, subscribe to us. And if you would like any further information, definitely visit our website and reach out to us. You may also find our free reports on the websites as well, where you can download this free information for yourself. Have a great day.